Thank you, Mark. Is this too loud? About right? Okay. <clears throat> I think I'll stand down here in front. Okay, so uh, thanks for coming out on this uh, cold evening. Uh, as Mark said, I am a theoretical chemist, recently retired. I got my PhD at Berkeley in uh, 1987. I was a professor at Stanford until 94 before coming to UGA. And I just retired last year at the grand old age of 58. And some people ask why I took a, quote, early retirement. And the answer I give is, so I can do science and research and scholarship exactly the way I want to without constraints. <laughs> so I'm uh, very happy to be liberated in that respect. Uh, please don't think that I'm retired from doing research or scholarship. I still have my lab at UGA, uh, still publishing papers. Mitchell can attest to uh, some of this. But another thing I've done with half of my time is to start a nonprofit foundation uh, with my sister and my father in honor of my mother who died four years ago. Okay, and we call it the Allen Heritage Foundation. And it is uh, centered in uh, Dixon, Tennessee, which is just outside of Nashville. And uh, my part of it is to promote STEM education uh, and I'm doing work with some high school students that is, I think, very, some very novel programs that we have going on, and that has been very uh, rewarding for me. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, the title of my talk, A Christian Vision for Modern Science. Let me start out by mentioning some resources. Some of the ideas that I will be talking about tonight came from a book club that we had in the Center for Computational Chemistry at UGA. It was some Christian graduate students. Uh, we would meet once a week uh, to read a book and discuss it together. And one of the books that we uh, went through was this one, The Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship by uh, Marsden. <clears throat> now, Many of us consider ourselves scholars and also consider ourselves Christians. What Marsden is trying to do is to go beyond thinking in two different boxes in that respect, to think about what distinctive things that are Christian could we apply to our scholarship? And uh, how could we be not a Christian comma scholar, but a uh, a Christian scholar, okay. <clears throat> and this is more difficult in some areas than others. If you're a quantum chemist like me, what in the world does it mean to be a Christian quantum chemist? I struggled with that while we read this book, and I will share with you some of my thoughts as we proceed. There's another book by Marsden that I would advocate. You uh, take a look at The Soul of the American University, uh, published in 94. This book can be rather dry because it has such a voluminous uh, compilation of facts, okay? But if you put this book on your shelf and do some referencing of it, you will realize that all the great universities, the great research universities in this country were founded with the Christian vision. And that we need to, to grasp as Christians. Many of these same universities uh, go out of their way to hide the fact of this origin uh, these days, but that origin itself gave them the very reason for existence. Another resource I would recommend, a book written in the mid-90s <clears throat> called The Soul of Science. It's written by Nancy Piercy and Charles Thaxton, Christian Faith and Natural Philosophy. Uh, this really is a must read if you have not studied much about the history of science and the history of the Christian influence on science. <clears throat> and finally, in the year 2000, as the new millennium turned, a large international conference was put together at Georgia Tech 
in which uh, Christian academics from all over the world were invited to attend. And I was invited to uh, give a talk there and submit an essay. And a lot of the stuff I'll be talking about tonight comes from this earlier essay. It's published in this book, Science Christian Perspectives for the New Millennium, which is rather hard to get. So if you want to get a PDF copy of my essay on this, uh, please give your name to Mark and we'll uh, make sure that that gets to you. There are some rather eminent people here. It's hard to pick up, but uh, Philip Johnson, Britt Schaefer, uh, Alvin Plantinga, Walter Bradley, Michael Behe, and then for some reason I was in there. I was happy to have my essay in there uh, if you want to go read about it. <clears throat> okay, enough preliminaries. The first thing I want to try to convince you is that really we have a continuing scientific crisis in this country. I would cite a 2005 study by the Task Force on the Future of American Innovation. And boy, then I didn't see how that just disappears when I go up there. Uh, the title of their study was The Knowledge Economy is the United States Losing Its Competitive Edge. There is another piece of research done by the National Academies uh, in the same vein. Let me share with you some of the task force findings. Now, these are applicable for the year 2005, but they're close to the same today. <clears throat> in universities, the percentage of degrees in science and engineering is significantly less in the US than in our competitor countries. 5.7% in the US, but 8 to 13% in countries like Japan, Taiwan, South Korea. In other words, we are producing about half as many graduates with science and engineering degrees as some of our competitors. Number two. The proportion of US citizens in science and engineering graduate schools has declined. It's probably flattened out by now, but that decline was rather dramatic going into the year 2005. I found it to be unbelievable that more than half of all science and engineering graduate students at US universities were foreign citizens. Now, historically, we would have people come into our institutions, learn their craft, become US citizens, and stay. Okay? That doesn't happen quite so much anymore because the countries of origin have built up their uh, scientific enterprise, and so many of these people go back. And so we are failing to train American students and American citizens that would help our competitiveness. More than half of those with science and engineering degrees in the US workforce are age 40 or older. Now, those people that would have been age 40 when this came out are now 55 or more, okay? So without a real influx of young people, uh, this statistic would even be more severe. So there is likely to be a continuing shortage of high-tech talent in the next century. The American share of worldwide science and engineering research publications has been going down. It was 38% in 1988, that's world dominance, okay? But it went down to 31% by 2001 and in the 20% uh, these days, and Western Europe, considered in totality, has passed the U.S. in this measure of scientific and engineering research publications. Not surprisingly, the U.S. share of high-tech exports uh, has and went down during uh, the period of study here. In 1980, we had 31% of high-tech exports, and by 2001, only 18%. And in 
and competitors such as China and South Korea have been skyrocketing upward in that respect. <clears throat> and finally, I'll share a personal note. For some years, I did collaborative work with a fellow scientist at Argonne National Laboratories, which is outside of Chicago. Uh, this is the Department of Energy facility. <clears throat> and usually when I would go there, I would stay in around the offices of my colleagues. But one day, I just sort of got out and started walking the halls. And it's not uh, a, it is uh, not a top secret research facility. You don't have to have a clearance to get in there, so I wasn't violating any laws. <laughs> okay, uh, <clears throat> but I managed to, you know, just look in some of the windows of the labs, and I found that a good number of them were just empty, or there were labs that were fully equipped that no longer had staff people in there, just because of the cutbacks uh, in funding. <clears throat> so this was of concern. The final thing that I will emphasize about a scientific crisis at hand is the results of the PISA test. This is an international test given to about 80 countries. The test is designed in an equivalent way to measure the math, science, and reading achievement of 15-year-olds. And for the 2018 results in math and science, you see them listed here, uh, China, restricted to some major cities, including Beijing, uh, Shanghai, and the like, was uh, categorized as number one. I have some, suspicious, some, some suspicions that they restricted the regions of the test so that they would look the best on this ranking, okay. However, Singapore is number two. If you've ever been to Singapore, they run a really tight ship <laughs> with excellent education. It's a very small place, so you cannot doubt this number. <clears throat> uh, five and six, Japan and South Korea. Uh, but look over here. The United States is 37th in math. I can't understand how we could possibly survive with that ranking. Uh, ahead of us would be Netherlands, Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, France, even Russia. We do better comparatively in science. We're ranked number 18. <clears throat> but I still think you understand that we have a, a real concern. Now, it's not as if American young people are dumb, okay? It's not as if we're not trying really hard to improve uh, STEM education. Our approaches sometimes don't seem to be working. One problem, I believe, is to ask the question to a young a person, what is your motivation for studying math, science? Why would you want to in the first place? And I'm proposing tonight that we have better answers to that question than have been given these students in the past. <clears throat> so in that lecture I gave in the year 2000, there was at Georgia Tech, there was a lot of emphasis on charting the course for the future of science and how would a Christian vision for that fit in. And in trying to decide what science should be and should look like going forward, the first thing I realized is that it's impossible to say something very meaningful unless you're basing your comments on principles that are timeless. Just think about this. <clears throat> Suppose I had been tasked in the year 1900 with giving a lecture charting the course of science into the 20th century. At the time I would be writing that essay, the structure of the atom would remain a mystery. We would not understand why atoms hold together. There would be no quantum mechanics. Mark, can you imagine life without quantum mechanics? 
Einstein didn't do general or special relativity into the first couple of decades of the 1900s. There was virtually complete ignorance about biochemistry. The structure of DNA and its function was not elucidated to the 1950s. There were no antibiotics. Fleming's discovery serendipitously of uh, penicillin didn't come for another uh, 20 years or so. No airplanes or spacecraft. If you go to the Wright Brothers Museum in Kitty Hawk, you'll find the emphasis that from 1900 to 1970, we went from uh, the first airplane to landing on the moon. There, there was incredible acceleration there. So who could have predicted anything like that? And of course, there were no computers. Now, I'm old enough to go back to the days that there were no computers. Could you believe that? So the first calculators came out when I was in eighth grade. <clears throat> and they could just do simple addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Nothing more sophisticated. That We thought this was incredible. Okay. Prior to that, you would be using slide rules and the like. It's hard to conceive of that. So going forward in science, you have to recognize that there are going to be technical and theoretical developments probably still that we just cannot fathom. But the key is, I think there are some timeless principles that should guide us through all of that, and that's what I want to talk about for the rest of my time here. And there are four buzzwords. If you take nothing else from the talk tonight, maybe you'll remember the buzzwords. Okay. So I guess I'm going to be knocking on the door of two of these young gentlemen tomorrow and see if they remember the buzzwords. Heritage. Dominion, form, and safeguard. So you can track my comments uh, according to which of these words is in the upper right, okay, here in my slides as we proceed. Let's start with heritage. <clears throat> you perhaps have never thought about this, but it is true that science as a discipline as a way of thinking, demands a unique kind of soil in order to flourish. If that were not the case, science would have sprung up millennia before it did in human civilizations. It's not really inherent in human thinking. It's something that has to be trained, okay? And when you look at the history of science, you find out that the soil, the society, the worldview that gave rise to organized science was the Christian worldview. It gave birth in an articulate fashion to the experimental method of science itself, to the scientific method. Christianity indeed gave faith in the very possibility of science. In order to do science, you have to have some faith in the back of your mind that it, it even can be done. I'll talk more about this in just a second. <clears throat> the understanding of this, I think, is important, and therefore I believe that the history and philosophy of science should be part of the education of scientists. But it is not. I never had such a course. I learned everything I'm telling you about by my own uh, efforts. Let me make an analogy here. <clears throat> uh, this last Christmas, I have an aunt who gave some T-shirts to some family members. And I'm sure she went online to a T-shirt company, and it had a nice little buzz word, and you filled your family name in right there, okay. But the t-shirt said, it's an Allen thing, in parentheses, you would not understand, okay. So, some of the Allens wear these t-shirts around town and have a fun time uh, uh, when we see one another, and others can poke fun at us, but What's the point? Well, it's suggesting that our family has some distinctives about it, and we're proud of them, okay? We identify with this family name, 
And we may do things a little weird, okay, a little quirky at times, but that's, that's part of us. <clears throat> One of the things our family is known for, at least on my father's side, is very hard physical labor. We would go out and dig a stump out of the ground with a, a mattock and an axe and a shovel alone rather than spending the extra money to have somebody grind it up. Why would you pay $500 for somebody to grind it up? Well, you can just go out and dig the stupid thing up in a few hours. I mean, that's our way of thinking. You know, it's an Allen thing. You wouldn't understand it, okay? <clears throat> well, I'm suggesting that Christians should view science that way. Science is a Christian thing, okay? You guys may not understand it, but it's a, it should be considered a Christian thing, part of our family heritage. Think about this. I have a picture here of uh, some tribesmen from the Amazon jungle. And I'm asking, if you were to immerse yourself into that village not knowing anything else about the outside world, I want to ask what kind of worldview would be necessary for you to be able to move beyond your regular experience there to an organized scientific perspective. Now, all cultures like this have some speculations about the natural world. Uh, generally, speculations like certain spirits live in this part of the forest and you don't want to offend them, okay, because bad things might happen to you when you go into that part of the forest. Or you might have certain views of creation, okay, along the way. And you certainly would have developed some manual arts in what I would call an algorithmic way. These uh, people have learned how to build huts, okay. <clears throat> They have learned that if you blow through some tubes here, you can make sounds, musical sounds. But they surely don't know why a certain sound comes out of that pipe. They don't understand the, the air molecules uh, creating standing waves in that pipe and the length of the pipe determines the frequency and, and the like. They don't understand the statics of physics of that construction, that for any element of a building, the sum of the torques has to be zero, or it'll be moving and collapsing, and the sum of the forces has to be zero. They don't understand those why questions. So many, many cultures develop these manual arts and speculations, but that's not what I'm talking about in terms of organized science. Well, tenets of Christianity that promoted this type of organized scientific uh, thinking are as follows. <clears throat> One, the universe is real. There is an objective reality out there that's independent of my perception of it. Okay? I'm not allowed to create my own reality in my own mind. There's something objective out there. It's not illusory. It's the product of a God whose character is not changing. Otherwise, the God of yesterday and the God of today would create a different universe and I couldn't depend on being able to predict anything. Suppose that you had a pantheistic view of nature, and they have gods of various types roaming around out there, interacting and having emotions like humans. If you read Greek mythology, you see all of this stuff. Well, you can't trust such a universe because it's not predictable. So if you have this pantheistic notion, you'd, you wouldn't even start science. It would be fundamentally impossible. <clears throat> Nature, being divinely created, is of inherent worth and therefore worthy of study. Indeed, as I'll proceed tonight, you'll see uh, that the Christian worldview gave rise to the idea that it's our, not just a pastime, it's our duty to study nature as Christians. <clears throat> nature itself isn't divine, 
and thus humanity may probe it free of fear. So we worship the creator, not the creation. People in a tribe like the Amazon tribesmen, if you're afraid of offending a local god, okay, you're not going to be free to investigate. You're going to be afraid that there's going to be retribution if you peer too much into that situation. Humans in the image of God can discover order in the universe by rational interpretation. We believe because we have been made in the image of God that we have minds that rationally can deduce truth okay, out there that indeed there are codes of nature that can be deciphered correctly by our minds. Finally, the form of nature is not inherent and has to be discovered by empiricism. So this view liberated science from Aristotelian philosophy, which was of the attitude that you could sit in a room and by rational deduction figure out what the universe must be like. Okay? And we know as scientists we can't do that. Even if we could deduce that the law of gravity has to be an inverse distance squared force law. We have no way of knowing the value of the universal gravitational constant. We would have to go out there and measure it. Okay. So the point is that God would be free to create the universe in many ways without constraint, and we have to go out and figure out what happened. Now, I think all of us take these issues for granted. <laughs> these days when we do science. But if you put yourself back centuries ago, you'll, you then realize why it is that the Christian worldview led to the creation of organized science for reasons such as these. And I would say that maintaining that heritage is important to maintaining science in society. We also take for granted that progress in science and technology is going to monotonically increase in time. Most of our lives we have witnessed this, but a broader view of history shows that that is not the case, that societies rise and fall, and when they collapse, their knowledge collapses with it. Think of the Mayans. They were very advanced people in the first millennium. Okay. Uh, you could argue that they were about as advanced as any other civilization in the world. But the Mayan civilization collapsed due to famine and warfare and disease and the like. And we are only now discovering how extensive it was. There's vast quantities of structures that are buried in the Guatemalan jungles, for example. Okay. Just think of how much knowledge was lost. We would be naive to think that we as humans today are impervious to anything like that. We need to be concerned about maintaining a proper soil okay, for science to flourish. And that proper soil uh, would have people, yes, capable of thinking in analytic depth, but the other part of it is wanting to, feeling a calling to do science. A postmodern culture that believes there really are no absolute truths is not the right soil to produce scientists. Okay? And likewise, a materialistic culture that is focused on self gratification is not likely to maintain science in the long run either. I cannot promise the young men sitting right here that you will get famous and wealthy if you do quantum chemistry. Okay? It could happen. It's likely that you will be able to live a reasonable lifestyle and support a family, okay? But I cannot give you that motivation of economic prosperity to do what you're doing. You need to have a better motivation than that. <clears throat> so let's move on to my second category of dominion. Of course, if you read the creation account in the first chapter of Genesis, you find that God gives human beings dominion over the earth. 
and Christians historically found motivation in that. In this respect, we were not created and left to just be part of the environment, to be one species among millions. Okay? We were commanded to take dominion over that. Now, how can you have dominion over nature? I would argue that ultimately, if you're going to realize this, you have to master science. And then you have to want to be good stewards. So to take dominion over nature does not mean to slash and burn for our selfish purposes, okay? It means to organize and manage it for greater good and to the glory of God. And I think that is an entirely appropriate motivation for doing science today. <clears throat> Indeed, from the first days that science started to appear as an organized discipline in Europe, uh, the goal was to glorify God, number one, and benefit mankind, number two. Reminds me of what the Westminster Catechism says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, okay? Uh, doing science fits in very nicely with that. <clears throat> Let me now talk about, in this idea of dominion, the contributions of Francis Bacon, who lived from 1561 to 1626. He's widely considered to be the father of the scientific method. He was a scientist, but he did many other things. He was an attorney general. He was a legal advisor to Queen Elizabeth I, a very influential figure. He was quite concerned with how we could sell the scientific enterprise to the public? How could we get the public to buy into the idea that science should be supported? Sound familiar? Okay. Well, he went about it this way. And I find these ideas applicable today and profound. Bacon said, the Bible is one of God's revelations. That's his special revelation. His special re revelation is the book of God's word. But Bacon said, there is another general revelation. That is the book of God's works. That is nature. And according to Bacon, we should study both books. Now, I don't think he means to say the book of nature trumps okay, the book of God's word, but he's saying that to study nature should be elevated in its importance as a way of learning about God. Historically, this doctrine placed the study of God's works in nature as an act of worship to be conjoined with the study of God's word. So back for these young men on this bench here. When you go into the laboratory on a work day, on a Monday morning, and start running your quantum chemistry calculations or whatever else you do, are you thinking about worshiping God? Bacon says you should be. You're doing the same thing because you are learning about God through studying his book of nature. There's scriptural justification for this. Read Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens, that's nature, are declaring what? Something about God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. In other words, there's some sort of universal language in which the book of nature is proclaiming the attributes of God. From Francis Bacon's book in 1605, and this little book is called The Advancement of Learning, this is what he says. Let's work around the Elizabethan English. Let no man think or maintain that someone can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's word or the book of God's works. 
In other words, you can't be too well studied in divinity or philosophy. By philosophy, he means science. Can't be too well studied. But rather let men endeavor in an endless progress of proficience in both. Only let men be aware that they apply both to charity and not to arrogance, swelling, okay, not to ostentation, and again, that they do not unwisely mingle or confound these learnings together. This is coming from a man who was the chief legal advisor to the queen. What do you think would happen in our day if the head of the Department of Education made this statement? Probably would not be too well received, at least by the general media, okay? But maybe Christians can understand this is how we should be thinking. <clears throat> John Cotton, who was the most eminent early Puritan minister, first in England and then New England, he said to study the nature and course and use of all God's works is what? A duty imposed by God. So science and technology find a timeless I'm trying to find timeless principles. They find a timeless principle, a timeless justification here. So we're trying to recapture this concept of dominion in the two books doctrine and the concept of science as a rational worship. There's one other sense in which this has affected my scientific career in particular my PhD thesis quoted this verse at the beginning in the acknowledgments, Colossians 3, 23, 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a, resort, as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Now, if you take that seriously, your scholarship is going to be top rate. When you're in the laboratory taking data, and you know everybody is prone to making mistakes, and one of the challenges is to execute a series of steps in the laboratory or in your computations that are devoid of mistakes so you can get correct answers uh, out of this. When you're doing this, are you thinking, I am trying to produce an accurate result for Jesus Christ? Or are you thinking, I want to generate enough data to get my PhD advisor to sign my dissertation so I can get a job? That way of thinking can go onward in the academic world, we submit papers, right, for review. We've been given papers to review. Is this a, just a game to play? Do we just have to run through this series of people swinging uh, swords and clubs at us to, to get to the end? Or is there some fundamental propriety, some fundamental end? Uh, and I think Christians should be motivated uh, toward taking this as seriously as possible. So if you're given a paper to review, well, you, maybe you ought to read some of the literature they cite <laughs> before you start propounding your opinions about it. Uh, maybe you ought to think carefully, uh, uh, perhaps even try to reproduce one of those results yourselves. And I know life is uh, difficult to live up to these ideals but this ideal, I believe, is something that Christians should have. So let me now talk about form, a third of my general uh, topics here. And this is a word that I use in the Platonic sense. If you've studied the philosophy of Plato, you know that he talked about the theory of form. His idea was that the world that we see is just a dim reflection of something that's in back of it, that's something that is perfect. And it would be fair to say that uh, the platonic sense of form is 
an abstract, perfect, unchanging concept transcending space and time. Well, you can dust off this idea from millennia ago and apply it to the mathematics behind the world that we experience. So in the Christian worldview, the universe is an orderly cosmos crafted by a rational God who is not capricious like those gods running around in the Amazon forest, okay? Uh, he's not lawless. He likes to set up laws that we can count on, that we can use, and then hold us accountable for that. Natural occurrences, according to the Christian worldview, are lawful, and they may be described in the beauty of mathematics. So it's the mathematical equations that are providing the, that's the form, that's the structure, okay, that uh, nature is abiding by. This idea was a central motivation of scientists such as Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. What motivated Newton? What motivated Galileo? Well, let's see. Let's come up with some quotes. Galileo's is attributed to this saying that the book of nature is written by the hand of God in the language of mathematics. Now, I tell most students who will listen to me that you can never know enough mathematics, okay? Well, I might justify that from Galileo here. If he's saying that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, it's like learning the vocabulary of a foreign language. The more vocabulary you know, the more you can function in that uh, society. Kepler, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the what? Rational order and harmony which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. These guys are telling us what motivated them to make their earth-shattering discoveries. And then there's Isaac Newton. <clears throat> I consider the greatest scientist of all time. I'm not alone in that. Some people like to put Einstein in there, but I would argue Newton had far more influence than Einstein. Einstein told us about special and general relativity when do we use that in our daily lives? <laughs> what we use in our daily lives, well, maybe quantum mechanics beneath it, but Einstein didn't come up with that. But what we use in our daily lives is classical mechanics. That's what helps us construct this building, this projector, and the like. And I like Newton because he was a mathematician far beyond Einstein. He, was, uh, he independently invented calculus. And we all use calculus, okay? <clears throat> Formulated the classical laws of motion. Invented and applied the laws of universal gravitation. Built the first practical reflecting telescope. Pioneered studies of light and optics. Theoretically determined the speed of sound. I could go on and on and on. Let's look at some quotes from Isaac Newton. The most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This being governs all things, and on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God. That's Isaac Newton. Continuing, from his true dominion, dominion it follows that the true God is a living intelligent and powerful being. Newton's view is that God has to be living because he is what gives rise to these laws and holds them in existence. Motion couldn't happen without God being alive. And from his other per perfections that God is supreme or most perfect, he is eternal and infinite, omnipotent and omniscient. That is, his duration reaches from eternity to eternity, his presence from infinity to infinity. 
He governs all things and knows all things that are or can be done. And then, just in case you're thinking that, well, maybe Newton was just a deist, he says, I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the word of God written by men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he studied the Bible daily. More quotes from Newton. When I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. Did blind chance know that there was light? And what was its refraction? And fit the eyes of all creatures after the most curious manner to make use of this refraction? These and such like considerations always have and ever will prevail with mankind to believe that there is a being who made all things and has all things in his power and who is therefore to be feared. We are therefore to acknowledge one God, infinite, eternal, omnipotent, uh, omnipresent, omniscient, the creator of all things, most wise, most just, most good, most holy, we must love him, fear him, honor him, trust in him, pray to him, give thanks to him, praise him, hallow his name, obey his commandments. That from the pen of the greatest scientist of all time, explaining his motivation for doing science. Well, in our time, we understand this idea of mathematical forms even more fully because we now have quantum mechanics uh, this is really the perfect model of reality. According to Dirac in 1929, after quantum mechanics was discovered, he says, the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are completely known. And the difficulty is only that we can't solve them. Okay. Here's a nice quote about quantum theory from Nick Herbert's book <clears throat> written for a popular audience. Quantum theory was devised in the late 20s to deal with the atom, a tiny entity a thousand times smaller than the wavelength of green light. Disturbed by its philosophical implications, many physicists at the time considered this theory to be only provisional and bound to fail outside the atomic realm. Quantum theory continued, however, to prosper beyond its inventor's wildest, wildest dreams. And then going downward, with each success, quantum theory became more audacious. Heaping success upon success, quantum theory boldly exposes itself to potential falsification on a thousand different fronts. Its record is impressive. It has passed every test we have devised. This theory is still batting a thousand. So I would say that to have a universe in which a mathematical theory can bat a thousand is a consequence of a rational God. So for lack of time, I won't go into more convincing that quantum theory is a champion of theories. Okay? But let me throw out a few thoughts. Someone appeared to know what they were doing in requiring quantum theory to hold at the atomic level for the following reasons. In classical physics, all atoms and molecules are unstable. The electrons just spiral into the nucleus and the whole thing collapses. So if classical mechanics held, there would be no atoms. Even if there were atoms with classical orbits, there could be no consistent chemistry. A carbon atom has six electrons. If those six electrons were allowed to orbit at just any different distance, every carbon atom would be different. My carbon atoms would be different than your carbon atoms. I can't build chemistry with carbon atoms that are not identical. Without the fundamental indistinguishability of all electrons, that's what we call the Pauli principle, there can be no strong chemical bonds. In other words, a fundamental weirdness about the theory is necessary 
for there to be any bonds. Without a small electron to proton mass ratio, the electron is 1,836 times less massive than the proton, so it's pretty small. If those two were close to being the same mass, all chaos would break loose because the nuclei would be as delocalized as the electrons. We would have just a murky quantum soup of particles with unknown information carrying function, uh, abilities. You would have DNA or cell structures or what uh, have you. Okay. Uh, someday, uh, I can tell you personally about my experiences. This latest paper I published in end of December was all motivated by my faith that there is an elegant mathematics to a 93-year-old problem. It had not been solved for 93 years. Why did I think there could even be a solution? Because I felt that God created a special universe, and so I spent the better part of a month, 16-hour days, and I solved the 93-year-old problem. But believe me, there were times that you, you never knew whether this was going to uh, crack, and there are plenty of times you could have given up. Okay. So let me finish just with a few comments about safeguard. My last point quickly. Christianity safeguards against impro Im improper philosophical groundings of science. You may not have studied this, but let me suggest to you there are two ways that people understand science. One is that science is based on philosophical assumptions of metaphysical naturalism. This assumption is that nature is all there is. Nature is a permanently closed system of material causes and effects, and it can be never influenced by anything outside. Christians cannot be metaphysical naturalists. Okay? Christians instead should be methodological naturalists. And this is the idea that science is an enterprise to bring as much as possible under explanation and description by physical laws. That's okay, is it not? Let's try to understand as much about the universe as we can by physical laws, but let's not presuppose that everything could be understood in that way. If you're a metaphysical naturalist, even the wildest naturalistic explanations have to be accepted because you have no alternative. Scientists have an alternative. For example, with respect to the origin of life, it's okay to try to come up with a naturalistic explanation, but you're not required to believe some ridiculous stuff because you say it had to have happened that way because there is no other alternative. So this is what I mean by safeguarding the scientific disciplines. And I can give examples of just so stories in that ilk, and I won't. So let me end with a charge to fulfill. I've given a Christian vision of modern science based on heritage, dominion, form, and safeguard, concepts on which science was built centuries ago, and I believe concepts that if we grasp them and apply them in the future, we will be in good shape. These guiding principles can provide Christians with inspiration in the practice of science. So we need to have a fundamental reason for why we should do science, and I think these principles provide them. The question of our time is whether there will be new generations of Christians called into the scientific disciplines that will address these crises that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk and who reclaim these principles that I have laid out in their individual practice. So thanks for listening, and I'll be happy to take any questions.